yours. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm Sanjay, I'm here to talk about practical foundations for software Spectre defenses. So kind of getting into things, so what exactly is a Spectre attack? So I'll continue by way of example. So Spectre is this kind of really strange uh, attack that it kind of destroys how we think about how processors should function in some sense. So in this example code, we're um, just accessing some array at some index and uh, standard memory safety checks. We want to make sure that the index is within bounds of the array before we access it. So we have this benign data. And we're accessing it somewhere within bounds. We want to make sure that that's the case. But processors don't actually execute instructions step by step. Uh, in the interest of performance, um, they'll actually try to work ahead, guess ahead what they're going to do. And so when they encounter a branch, uh, the processor is going to use a branch predictor to determine whether or not it's actually going to go into the branch without actually needing to calculate out any of the data. But the problem with prediction mechanisms is, of course, that they can mispredict. So if it turns out that uh, I is somehow way outside of the normal bounds, but the processor somehow mispredicts and ends up inside this branch anyway, then it's still going to continue to use I as an index for this array access and end up pulling in this very out of bounds data. And that data is going to go on to be leaked potentially. And so if an attacker can exploit this in some way where they can control the value of I and they can force the processor to mispredict, then they can end up leaking arbitrary data from this process. And so that's what we see in these specter attacks, but that's only one form of specter attack. Uh, and that's coming from misprediction of conditional branches. It turns out there's lots of different prediction features in modern processors. Uh, see, so we have um, whenever you return from a function call, the processor is going to predict where to go back to. Uh, for indirect jumps, it needs to determine where to jump to next and potentially guess anywhere else in the program. And in addition to control flow, there's also data flow prediction. So if you have a whole bunch of loads and stores in recent history, then the processor will try to predict whether or not certain loads and stores alias with each other or not and forward data accordingly. And all of these as prediction mechanisms can be exploited by an attacker to mispredict and uh, lead to uh, revealing secret data. And the problem that we see is that with this wide range of attacks, uh, we've, there's been a lot of essentially ad hoc mitigations where people find attacks and then patch those specific things and uh, there's not really been a principled approach. So the, uh, back when Spectre was first discovered, the Microsoft compiler um, introduced a compilation flag slash Q Spectre that was supposed to find Spectre attacks and mitigate them. But the way it was doing that was by uh, looking for patterns in the C source code. And so if you had a very slightly different source code pattern that would still result in a Spectre attack, the compiler would just not be able to catch it because it's looking for very specific patterns. So it misses a lot of attacks. Um, similarly with uh, Linux in their eBPF code, um, so the, the eBPF system in Linux allows you to uh, essentially run user programs in the kernel space. And so they need to make sure that that's protected from these kinds of attacks. And there's been a series of patches where they find an attack, patch it, find another attack, patch it, and so on. And um, Google Chrome, as the browser, has actually been trying to prevent Spectre attacks as well from uh, malicious JavaScript. And they've uh, introduced what they call strict site isolation uh, to separate processes and try to um, make sure that they can't affect each other. And if you stick around later in this track, uh, you'll hear folks talking about Spook.js, which uh, shows that this actually doesn't really work. And so like I said, the reason that, that these are all kind of failing is that there is no underlying principled approach here. And what we really need is formal methods to, to determine what exactly we're going to do and make sure we have a sound approach to protecting against these specter attacks. And so to be able to do that, you need to make sure you are picking the right attacker model for the kinds of programs that you're trying to protect. And once you have that attacker model, we can start uh, using that as a guide to build back up to the security properties that we lost because of speculative execution. And this first step, picking the right attacker model, is kind of non-trivial. Um, so some of the papers that we've looked at, um, so for example, Spectre is here to stay was one of the earlier papers where they had a model where the attacker can read a, a step counter of your program. 
but that is going to miss a whole bunch of attacks based on control flow that would leak via um, features like port contention or register pressure, things like that. It misses a whole class of leakage. Um, there was also another paper, 007, where they um, find specter attacks based on uh, what the attacker can influence. But that leaves out any attacks that happen through cross-process mistraining. And so again, we miss a whole uh, class of attacks. And these are real attacks that have been demonstrated. So it's clear that we do need to be able to capture these sorts of things. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have papers like Constant Time Foundations and Inspector that are very expressive. They allow you, uh, they allow the attacker the power to control uh, the entire range of execution, all of the instruction scheduling, and allow for arbitrary misprediction of values. And so they can actually represent all of these different specter attacks in their model. But if you try to use a model that's this broad for an actual practical tool, it doesn't work out. You would just end up with far too many false positives. Um, and so we really need a, a sweet spot of abstraction where we can kind of analyze programs in a sane way. And looking at all the, the papers that have come out thus far, we see two major domains of programs where we can apply these sorts of things. So there's uh, crypto code and there's sandbox systems. So for cryptographic code, you have very explicitly marked secrets. So you have secret keys, you have uh, plain text, and you want to be able to compute on these without leaking those values to an attacker. And so tools like uh, the ones developed in high insurance cryptography and in Hunting the Haunter build on top of existing practices that we've been using to secure cryptographic code. So before all of the, the Spectre stuff came out, there was already a great deal of interest in preventing timing side channels in cryptographic code using uh, what we call the, the constant time security model. So in the constant time security model, the control flow of the program and the memory trace should not be affected at all by secrets. And that's how you prevent leakage of these secret values. And so these tools take that idea of constant time leakage and translate it to speculative execution. And they can do a pretty powerful analysis because we know that cryptographic code generally has very simple control flow and very structured data. So there isn't a, a whole range of mispredictions that can happen. They can actually feasibly analyze uh, the different mispredicted paths. And so they, they take the idea of sequential constant time and just translate it to speculative semantics. Uh, so similarly, we see something in the uh, same sort of thing in sandbox systems. So sandbox systems, you want to be able to run untrusted code uh, while keeping it isolated. So like Linux eBPF, like I mentioned earlier, or in your browser, JavaScript, WebAssembly, um, you have code that could be potentially malicious, and you want to prevent it from accessing any data from elsewhere in the system. And so tools like Fenkman and Swivel uh, build on top of, again, existing uh, sandbox security properties that were developed in sequential models. So we assume that the attacker can leak anything that it reads, so we don't actually care in this case about whether you're leaking via control flow or memory accesses or something else. It's just if the attacker can access it at all, that's bad. Um, and in these sandbox systems, we know that the, the programs that are submitted are already highly structured. So for example, WebAssembly and eBPF already have enforced uh, very strict memory safety properties. And since the host has control over the sandbox, they have control over the sandbox execution. So the code that runs whenever you enter or exit the sandbox, and they also have uh, ownership over the code at this point. So they can rewrite the code to remove any of these speculative paths and have the program run as if it was running sequentially or have the same effects that it would if it was running sequentially. So taking this idea of sandbox security and again translating it to the speculative domain. And so once you have the right attacker model for your domain, you can start recovering these uh, security properties that were originally lost. So like we saw with crypto code, uh, we're taking a sequential idea and moving it to speculation. With sandboxing, the same thing. And so we'd like to think that in general, we should be able to take these sequential security properties and translate them in the same way to speculative execution. And that's exactly the kind of tack that uh, tools like Spectector and uh, FAS take. So instead of having 
um, specific leakage models, they just say, we're going to look at what your program would have leaked under a normal sequential execution, what you kind of expect it to have leaked um, when you're running it. And we're just going to make sure that under speculative execution, you don't leak anything more. And so that frees up the developer to only have to reason about their program in a sequential context. And so you don't have to, to worry about what's going on in the underlying hardware. You just leave that up to one of these tools to protect you. Unfortunately, the, the work that we've seen uh, so far has kind of been limited to security properties based on leakage models, so making sure that your programs don't leak anything more. But there are a whole bunch of other high-level security properties as well that Spectre has destroyed. So everything from general memory safety, type safety, control flow integrity, and so on. And these are all very important high-level properties that have been destroyed because Spectre is such a fundamental low-level bug. So we really want to try to rebuild security kind of from the ground up. Um, so we have uh, the, the work at the bottom. Um, there's been lots of great tools that are looking at uh, binary and assembly, so um, works like BINSEC and Spectector. And um, slightly above that, uh, tools like Jasmine, which operates on a um, sort of structured assembly, and Blade and Venkman, which operate on LLVM IR, which um, analyze programs and can compile them down to the binary level and ensure that they're free from specter attacks. And going one level higher, we have tools like Swivel that can operate on uh, slightly more structured languages like WebAssembly and make sure that in the translation to one level down, they uphold uh, security from specter attacks. And so what I, I really think we should focus on is being able to take that all the way up to the highest level. So can we get to the point where we can write programs in languages like C or Rust or perhaps even Haskell and be able to say, yes, this program is going to be free from specter attacks? And the work that we need to do to get there is to focus on these analysis and compilation techniques. So just how Swivel uh, can go from WebAssembly to a lower level and preserve specter, Jasmine Blade Venkman, the same thing, um, taking it down and at the bottom, uh, we have BINSEC and Spectector that can verify the, the bottom level that you're free from Spectre attacks. So being able to use these techniques to go all the way from the higher levels down to the bottom and make sure that we're free from Spectre attacks. Um, so this is actually where I'm going to leave you all with the talk. Uh, it was, uh, we looked at a, a whole wide variety of papers. There's lots of stuff that I wasn't able to talk about. Um, lots more open problems that are very interesting, uh, much more in depth. So please read our paper if you find this interesting, and definitely uh, come find me and talk to me if you're interested in any of this Spectre stuff. I'd love to chat about it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Or, uh, open for questions. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Any questions? Okay, I have a question. All right. So uh, one of the things you said is that um, uh, with the, the software defenses to Spectre, mm -hmm. you are trying to push to a higher level defense where you don't care about the details of the microarchitecture. Yes. So what if the hardware actually told you some of those details about how the hardware is working, such as the speculation window, the reorder buffer size? Do you still recommend against including those inf pieces of information into software defenses? Uh, I think that gets into how specialized you would want to be. Um, so I think it's kind of the same kind of trade-off that you would see, for example, when you're doing optimizations, where the, the level of uh, specialization towards a processor determines how much performance you can get. So uh, if you're trying to write general cryptographic programs, for example, that you want to know are secure on a wide variety of processors, you would want to abstract over that. But if you're, for example, writing like a very dedicated Intel x86 library, then maybe you would want to be able to exploit some of those features while knowing that it's still secure. We have yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it looks to me from this slide that much of the work had been done like in different layers, right? So I, and I assume that you have some kind of like semantic for all these kind of like levels. Mm -hmm. Is there any work in actually trying to relate from one layer to the other already? Like yes. for some, some compilation steps, like saying if this happened and my compiler did this, then I guarantee that in the lower level, like the results are gonna remain. Yes, uh, so I know that um, Blade for sure does that. It, it sets up a uh, simple language that represents the LLVM IR that it produces. 
uh, and then translates that to another semantics that represents the assembly and shows that after the translation, the assembly is still going to be free from Spectre. Um, there's also a paper, uh, it's hardware software contracts that does a similar thing, um, but comparing software semantics to what the hardware promises. So going even one step below that and, and showing how you can uh, compare uh, the software versus what's actually running on the hardware. So it's some kind of a refinement relation, I, I guess. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Okay, well, I'll ask one last question. All so right. um, one of the uh, things that you talked about at the beginning of the talk was uh, strict process isolation. Yes. Uh, so how would you model strict process isolation as uh, software mitigation using these foundations that you describe in your paper? So I would consider it, so in terms of the models that I presented here, I would consider it a form of sandboxing um, where you have uh, all of these different processes. Would, you could treat them as different sandboxes and you'd have to make sure that you're making the right assumptions about what is actually going, uh, what data can be shared between the different sandboxes and how they're set up. Okay, let's thank the speaker once again. All right.